How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I am dandy-less. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing delicious. I don't know. And delicious. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Well, good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Thanks. I think How I'm are doing you? okay myself. Aww. I do think I'm fine. Good. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I think. Hope yeah. so, Buttercup. Yeah. I do have an episode today that was written by our dear friend Fern. Fern is amazing. Evidence of a crime, which it's she no longer records evidence of a crime, but she needs to. She, she might do something else down the road. Down Still the road. Important. I know. So but thank we you, love Fern. her. We think Fern she's awesome. There you go. See how I tied in the dandy delicious Fern delicious. You know what I'm saying? Fern's an awesome gal. This episode takes place in the UK. So well, hit me up. Let's I go. I had never heard of it, so I'm pretty sure you haven't either. I can't wait. <laughs> On September 14th, 2015, Nicola, Nikki, as she was known by her friends and family, Cross, tucked her two children, Stanley and Isabella, into bed and kissed them goodnight. Her husband, Daniel, had left the house earlier that morning on a business trip, traveling three hours north to Hull. I just wanted to let you know that I know where Hull is because that's the home of Lee and Jenny from Gogglebox. <gasps> just wanted to throw that I was gonna in. Say, I have no idea where that is, but okay, oh, good. I love Lee and Jenny. They're one of my favorites. But anyway, he was traveling three hours north to Hall from their three-bedroom home in Himmel, Hempstead. The couple kept in touch throughout the day, speaking over the phone. And after spending the day driving and working, Danny decided to go to bed early, ready to return to his family the following day. Back in Himmel, Hempstead... Nikki began to relax. Having already put her two children to bed, she was ready to enjoy the evening, nice and quiet. Amen, but sister. Yep. It was a typical Monday evening, and Nikki wasn't expecting any visitors, so when she began to hear strange noises outside of her house at 10.30 p.m., she became highly concerned. When Nikki went to see what was happening, she saw an unknown male with his face pressed up against the window, staring at her. The man then began hitting her car before pounding on the door, demanding Nikki let him in. Frozen in fear, Nikki quietly called the police, who arrived at her house within minutes. The police found the strange man outside the house and stopped to search him. They described him as, quote, bit distant, but allowed him to leave since there was really no reason to detain him. After the police allowed him to leave, he walked home grabbed a small knife from his knife block, and headed back around the corner to Nikki's house. Nikki, you know, a mother knows, was suspecting something wasn't right. So she called the police for an update, and she was told that the officers had let the strangers go. And of course, that would send me into a panic, and I'm sure it did Nikki also. So Nikki immediately called her husband and woke him up, explaining to him what had happened. As the children lay sleeping, Nikki and Danny tried to develop a plan about what she should do next. They discussed whether Nikki should go to his parents' house with the children just to stay the night to get out of their own house. Yes. Thank you. About totally. the same time, yes. at around 1125, the stranger smashed the rear patio door at the house next door as they were on the phone talking. The owner of the house had just gotten out of the shower and shouted, What are you doing here? 
Then the stranger realized that he was in the wrong place, and so he left. Then, just seconds later, the man threw a large pot through the back patio doors of the Cross's house and entered Nikki's home. He picked up another large knife from the knife block in Nikki's kitchen and began climbing the stairs to a now petrified Nikki, who clung on to her mobile phone, placing herself between this man and her defenseless sleeping children. 200 miles away and completely helpless, Danny listened to Nikki as she confronted the intruder by telling him to get out, and then she pleaded with him that he didn't have to do this. The stranger shouted, quote, I do, I do, and Nikki began to sob as she offered to help him. Danny dialed the police using the phone in his hotel room and began relaying as much as he could from what he could hear on the other end of the line. Suddenly, Nikki began to scream, and the room fell silent. Danny knew what had happened. He begged the police to hurry, knowing that his children's, aged six and three, were now alone with a killer. Daniel Cross said in his statement, quote, I was on the phone before, during, and after. That phone call plays over and over in my head, along with Nick's screams and her pleading for her life. I will never forgive myself for not being there to protect her. I am totally and utterly heartbroken. Using both knives, the intruder stabbed Nikki ten times. One of the stab wounds had pierced the left ventricle of her heart. It was a fatal wound in which she would have lost consciousness in just a matter of seconds. The man then made his way to the children's bedrooms and placed a knife down on the bedside table. As he tried to lead them out of the house, one of the children shouted, No, I don't want you here. He guided them past their mother's body and attempted to take them out into the backyard. The police were already at the scene investigating the break-in next door to Nikki's house when they heard her blood-curdling screams. They rushed to the house as she was being attacked but were unable to gain access. The front door was locked. They couldn't get in. After racing around the back of the property, they discovered the killer holding one of the children's hands, and he was immediately arrested. When the police gained access into the house, one of the children told them, quote, he has hurt my mummy badly. Police discovered Nikki's body lying on the bathroom floor and attempted to resuscitate her, but unfortunately they couldn't bring her back. They did find a small knife that was used in the attack, and it was broken, with the handle in one place and the blade being in a different area of the bathroom, making it clear that he had continued his savage attack with the larger knife that he had taken from Nikki's kitchen. After hearing emergency services at the scene and having confirmation that his children were safe, Danny hung up the phone. He couldn't bear to listen any longer. The children were kept upstairs with trained officers as police combed the scene for evidence. Danny began the long journey back from Hall, and thankfully, the only injuries the children sustained were minor cuts on the soles of their feet as a result of standing on broken glass. Thank goodness. Ooh. Let's talk about Nikki for a little bit. So, so many people loved Nikki Cross, and the impact of her death was felt deeply by everyone who knew her. She loved helping people and was kind, generous, and a beautiful person in every way possible. She's described as, quote, the perfect wife and most amazing mummy. And Nikki loved her husband and her two children more than life itself. She had two mottos, and they were, one, to keep aiming, and two, never give up. She made sure to let her children know every day that she was proud of them, no matter what. Three years prior, in 2012, Nikki set up her own business from home named Spruced Tags, where she used her incredible talent to create custom gifts like personalized photo frames, cards, and whatnot for local customers. She would advertise and sell on Facebook, and this was a complete success for her. She worked from home doing something she loved while caring for her children, which many parents dream of doing. And according to Danny, Nikki was the heart and soul of their family. They were just a usual happy family with no concerns or enemies. 37-year-old Nikki and 38-year-old Danny had been married for 11 years. And just weeks before she was killed, she and Danny traveled to Mayoka with the two children to enjoy a summer holiday. 
Now, Danny was left alone to explain everything to their two children, a conversation that nobody ever expects to have, and one he didn't even understand yet. The community was appalled by the level of brutality enforced on Nikki that evening. Together, they placed bouquets of flowers outside the property and left messages for Nikki to show the family support. One of the messages stated, quote, The world is a darker place without you in it. Most murders of this nature are committed by somebody known to the victim, not a total stranger. Now, before we get into it, I want everybody to know that Fern is from the UK. So a lot of her statistics and everything are UK statistics, and I'm sure they're pretty closely, they align with the US when I mention all this stuff. The Office of National Statistics posted a 2017 and 2018 homicide review of England and Wales. And the results show that partners or ex-partners committed the majority of female homicides. Although the rate is rising, violent murders committed by total strangers with no apparent motive are rare. And this was the case in a small town of Himmel, Hempstead. Many residents began to fear for the safety of their own families. However, Detective Inspector Jerome Kent from the Hertfordshire Major Crime Unit issued the following statement, quote, Nicola's family remain forefront in our minds at this extreme tragic time. The children are safe and with family, who continued to be supported by specially trained officers. We fully appreciate the events of Monday night have also significantly impacted the wider community. However, I would like to reassure you that this was a tragic and isolated incident the events of which are highly unusual within Hertfordshire. Officers remain in the area to offer reassurance and residents are encouraged to talk to them if they have any concerns. We also understand people want answers, but as you can imagine, this has been and remains an extreme complex investigation. As a man has now been charged, it is important for us not to speculate further to ensure the justice system can run its course. Within days, the media published the identity of the killer. His name was 23-year-old Marcin Porchinski. How, how do you spell that? M-A-R-C-I-N. Okay. And it can be pronounced Marcin or Marsan, but okay. Porchinski seems to be common, so that's what I'm going to go with. I'd go with that, yep. Uh-huh. So according to Porchinski's Facebook page at the time, he was born in Kielce, Poland. And he had only resided in Hempel Hempstead for a short while before he murdered Nikki. He was employed as a warehouse worker in a Martin Brewer distribution center, but mostly kept to himself, so nobody knew anything about him. His housemate, Robert, had serious concerns about him, though. He spoke of how Porchinski had been hearing voices for around two years and that he had been worried about him in the immediate weeks before Nikki's murder because he was talking about things that hadn't happened. He is quoted saying, this is the roommate, was quoted saying, I was worried about him. He needs help and is not himself, and none of us can believe he would have killed somebody. Perchinski was charged with murder, two counts of kidnap, burglary, aggravated burglary, involving a weapon of offense. Perchinski appeared at Hatfield's Magistrate's Court for the first time just three days later, on Thursday, the 17th of September, 2015, and again a day later via video link at Luton Crown Court. He didn't speak during both of those hearings, except for confirming his name and address for the court. His trial was scheduled to take place on March 7, 2016, so the agonizing wait began for Nikki's family to finally get justice. Over 400 people attended Nikki's funeral at Garston's crematorium on Friday, the 6th of November, with people wearing bright colors. It was a wish Nikki had expressed herself long before her death. The day was to be a celebration of her life, and the number of people in attendance was a testament of how loved she truly was. As the Cross family awaited Perchinski's trial, Nikki's husband, Danny, along with friends, decided to create Nikki's wishes. Nikki's wishes began as a way to raise money and support charities such as Child Bereavement UK, which had been crucial for the Cross family following Nikki's death. So according to the Facebook page of Nikki's wishes, quote, the objective of Nikki's wishes 
are to move forward promoting her positive attitude to life by continuing to produce products in her signature style, host fun events for local community, and to support both local causes and national initiatives in Nikki's memory. On May 15th, 2016, the family held their first of several annual fundraising events, named the Nikki Cross Memorial Cup and Family Fun Day. The event was endorsed and promoted by many celebrities, including One Direction's Niall <gasps> Horan. Oh my God, I love him. I don't know, James Corden and footballer Rio Ferdinand, who was also grieving the loss of his wife. The day was filled with activities for children, but the main event was the football match. That's where Danny and his friends competed alongside ex-professional footballers, and the goal was to raise as much money as possible for the Child Bereavement UK. Following a nine-month delay in court proceedings, Perchinsky's trial began at St. Albans Crown Court in December of 2016. Porchinski appeared via video link from Rampton Hospital. It's a psychiatric hospital, by the way. There he pleaded not guilty to all charges, but instead pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Consultant psychiatrist Dr. Philip Joseph carried out a complete psychiatric evaluation of Perchinski while he was in custody. The court heard that while in custody, Perchinski had officially been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And while there, he had also carved the names of Polish people into his leg. No. Mm. It was also said that when he was arrested, he had traces of cannabis and cocaine in his bloodstream. And he admitted that he had smoked cannabis around seven weeks before he was arrested. And Dr. Philip Joseph didn't believe that either drug would have affected Porchinski's actions when he murdered Nikki. I agree. Pot weed makes you lazy. You're not well, gonna. And but there's something that I read, and not that seven weeks I think is a long time. But there was something I just skimmed over that a doctor said with schizophrenia. Most people with schizophrenia are not violent, but sometimes when drugs are involved, that's when they become violent. Or if the person had taken drugs. Hmm. So I didn't delve into it. So I probably shouldn't mention it now. As that's I was okay. briefly skimming something, that's what I caught. I'll try to put that link in here. Porchinski had also admitted that he had no idea Nikki's children belonged to her and that he had been hearing voices that had been instructing him to free her children or potentially risk harm to his own family. He was under the impression that he was freeing children who were being starved to death mm. or just starved. He is described as being extremely remorseful and devastated by the impact of his actions. Schizophrenia is a complex condition of the mind, and the cause is still completely unknown, although most believe the condition is a result of genetic and environmental factors. The condition can develop independently, or it can be triggered by things like stress or drug misuse. The stigma surrounding schizophrenia is one of the many reasons why people who have the disease often choose to keep this to themselves and do not reach out for help. And according to the NHS, which for everybody not in England means the National Health Services in England, doctors describe schizophrenia as a type of psychosis where the person suffering may not distinguish between what is real and what isn't. It is estimated that around 26 million people live with schizophrenia worldwide. The largest misconception about people with schizophrenia is that they are frequently violent and presumed to be dangerous at all times, but this is not true. Rethink.org states that only a small number of people with schizophrenia will become violent, and the danger they pose is mainly to themselves, not other people. They state, quote, as these incidents can be shocking, the media often report them in a way which emphasizes the mental health aspects. This can create fear and stigma to the general public. People with schizophrenia can usually tell when they're beginning to go into this psychosis, medically known as an acute episode. This person would be instructed to reach out to their doctors for help and support. 
The mentalhealth.org.uk website states, quote, some people need a great deal of help in managing the symptoms of schizophrenia. Others find a way to cope with experiences such as hearing voices and do not necessarily wish to receive any treatment. Sometimes people in an acute phase of the illness may need to be admitted to the hospital for their own or for other people's safety. Porchinsky had no idea that he had schizophrenia. His family wasn't aware that he had the disease either, so he never reached out for medical help regarding schizophrenia. So the risk he posed was unknown. Dr. Philip Joseph eventually concluded his statement by insisting that Perchinsky would need to remain on medication for the rest of his life so he would no longer pose a risk to the public, as failing to do so would result in a relapse in his psychosis. A number of Nikki's friends and family were in attendance during the trial alongside her husband. Danny took the stand to read out his victim impact statement and spoke to Perchinsky directly for the first time. In it, he said, quote, the phone call that plays over and over in my head, along with Nick's screams and her pleading for her life, I will never forgive myself for not being there to protect her. I see no future happiness. I see no end to this trauma until my own life comes to an end. When Marcin Perchinsky killed Nick, he killed one person, but destroyed numerous other lives. As Danny was reading his statement, Porchinsky broke down in tears. His sentence was delivered on the 21st of December, 2016. He was ordered to remain at Rampton Hospital indefinitely, and that's one of three infamous high-security psychiatric hospitals in England. I almost said high schools. Here, he would receive continuous psychiatric treatment. The sentencing judge, Andrew Bright of the Queen's Council, said the following, Although Nicola Cross tried to reason with you and heroically did her best to protect herself and her two young children from you, she was completely defenseless against the vicious knife attack you then launched upon her. You have devastated the lives of the Cross family and left two young children to grow without a wonderful mother who so loved and cared for them. Those responsible for deciding if and when you should ever be released back into the community will need to look long and hard at the full circumstance of the dreadful killing which your mental illness led you to commit. It is plainly necessary for the protection of the public from serious harm to impose a restriction order because there is currently a serious risk that you would commit further offenses if set at large. The judge also stated that if Porchinsky ever left Rampton Hospital, his mental health would have to be monitored continually to ensure that this never happens again. Following the conclusion of the trial, Philip Mansfield, a District Crown's prosecutor with the Crown Protective Service, said, When Porchinsky indicated a guilty plea to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, we carefully and thoroughly reviewed all the evidence in this case including the assessment of independent psychiatric reports. In light of all the evidence, the Crown Prosecution Service took the view that it was appropriate to accept the plea and thoroughly discuss the decision with Nicolo's husband before accepting the plea. This case represents a devastating tragedy with Nicola, a wife and a mother of two, being killed in such horrific circumstances. I would like to thank her husband, and family for the support they have given to the prosecution of this case. Our thoughts are very much with all of Nicola's family and friends at this time. This was followed by another statement from Jerome Kent, the detective chief inspector of the Hertfordshire Major Crime Unit. He said, This was an incredibly tragic incident. It is highly unusual to be randomly attacked in your own home and is one of the saddest cases I've ever dealt with. The pain Porchinsky has inflicted on Nicola's family is unimaginable. They have shown great dignity since her death, and our thoughts remain with them all. Sadly, I'm sure no sentence passed could ever ease their suffering. In the initial days following Nikki's murder, the Hertfordshire Police referred itself to the Independent Police Complaints Commission regarding the actions taken by officers on the night Nikki was brutally murdered. This was also joined by an independent complaint filed by Nikki's grieving husband, Danny. He believed that the police did not communicate with Nikki enough and could have done more at the time to ensure she was safe that evening. 
I kind of agree with that, but we'll see. That's not what they believe. Hindsight's 2020. I know. After a long and thorough investigation, the IPCC concluded that all of the officers involved followed the specified guidelines and that no actions undertaken that evening would be considered misconduct. They concluded their findings by offering their condolences to the Cross family. Now, I think that maybe they should change their guidelines. Oh, just, you know. If Change some, is hard, Jen. I know, but if somebody was coming up to your house and being a threat, they should at least keep somebody close. That's just my thoughts. Well, and like schizophrenia, it's all horrible. that stuff is so, like it puzzles me about how your mind can do that. And, you know, a lot of times, mostly they're not harmful, but right. there's always, you right. know, but he was, things like this. He, yeah, Mm. but still, he wanted to get into that house. There was something with up with him that the police should have said. He focused in on that with his mind. But it just would have been nice if the police would have said, you know what, we're going to put somebody in the neighborhood. Somebody out there. Just to watch, just to make sure he doesn't come back. Just in case, yeah. Or they could have called her or knocked on the door and said, listen, this is what, I mean, she had to call the police herself to get what happened. The police just didn't. Tell her what I'm happened. I'm sure the police probably thought it was not. No one ever thinks that could happen, but yet it does. Around a year and a half, 18 months after Nikki's murder, Danny appeared on the TV series SAS, Who Dares Wins. This competitive show, hosted by former soldiers, SAS means Special Air Services, centers itself around the notoriously difficult Secret Service selection process. 30 applications are tested to their limits physically and emotionally, and the majority of contestants typically withdraw themselves from the process voluntarily due to the level of difficulty. I was just thinking I've never heard of it. mm -hmm. A clip from the show, which has been viewed over three million times on YouTube, shows Danny candidly discussing what happened the night that Nikki was killed and the effect that her murder had on himself and his children who he says gave him enough strength to make it through it all. Now, the whole nation fell in love with Danny. Unfortunately, he had to give up his place on the show due to a knee injury. Even though he wanted to carry on, the show's creators didn't want him to leave the show with a permanent injury just at the time when his children needed him the most. Mm -hmm. So Danny left the show with his head held high, knowing that he had done all he could, claiming he was no longer scared of the unknown. I watched this testimony. Tears. Trust me. Mm. Tears. Danny also published an emotional blog post on Nikki's Wishes website discussing how he dealt with the first 18 months following Nikki's death. When Nick was taken from us, our world quite literally fell apart. Nick was the glue that made all of the different parts of our family stick together to create a wonderfully loving environment for the children to grow up in. But she was gone in a blink of an eye. The loving mummy of our two children had been killed while attempting to stop an intruder armed with two knives from taking our children. Brave doesn't even come close to describing her actions in that couple of minutes. I know full well how hard she fought to keep her baby safe. I was listening. Being honest with the kids is tough. You have to tell them the truth in order for them to process what has happened. But do it in a way that children will understand. The first time I understood this was Tuesday, the 15th of September, at 7 a.m., Nikki had been killed seven hours ago, and I'd spent three hours on the back of a police car being brought home from Yorkshire, where I had been away on business for just one day. I was sat on my brother's sofa, and the children came down and sat with me. The first question they asked is, is mommy coming back? It felt like I thought about the answer for a week, but in reality, it was milliseconds, and I remember exactly what I said to them. No, mommy isn't coming back. 
She's gone to heaven. She's an angel now. I realized in that instant that I was not going to make things up, and I was to be as honest as possible with the children throughout everything that was going to come to us in the coming days, weeks, months, and much further down the line. This isn't a process that ends after 20 months. As they grow and their emotions change and their understanding of the world grows, so will their curiosity about what happened and why. The why is something my son contemplates a lot. It's hard to see him struggle with such difficult thoughts at seven years old. Being honest with myself is a bit harder. I'm a man. I don't need help. I'll cope somehow. After a few weeks, I decided to ask for help with my own trauma. That was the single best decision I have ever made. Recognizing within myself I needed help and asking for it, my recovery started the very first trauma counseling session I had. You cannot put a price on getting good help. People tell me I'm strong, but don't think for one second that means dealing with everything yourself and trying to bury your issues. Being strong for me is knowing yourself and not being afraid to admit when you need help from others. In mid-2018, Danny announced the news that he was going to remarry an amazing woman who had helped him and his children cope with the loss of Nikki. He claims she fits perfectly into their lives as a mental health clinician, and she is exactly what he and the children needed to move forward in life. In an interview on This Morning, he claimed that he and Nikki had already spoken about the possibility of him moving on following recent health issues that she was facing. She had told them that she would want him to be happy if anything were to happen. As a family, they make sure to include Nikki in everything that they do for the sake of the children. And Danny says that his new fiancé takes everything in her stride and is totally understanding of the situation. Danny now volunteers for Peer Support Program run by the Homicide Victim Support Service and is assigned families dealing with their similar, dealing with similar circumstances to what his family went through. There, he can offer empathy and support to those who need it. He also continues to run Nikki's Wishes, which is now a registered charity aiming to support children dealing with the bereavement of a parent or sibling in the Hertfordshire area. And if you would like to support them, you can go to the website nikkiswishes.org and you can donate your time or money. It's a really, I was looking through the Nikki's Wishes it's wonderful. I mean, they do a quarterly fun family day. They raise money for needy children for Christmas. They do runs. And it's kudos, a good program. kudos to the uh, new new wife that would support that because you know what? That's always going to be their mom. It's always going to be his, you know, somebody that was important in his life. So and I saw a little bit of the interview on this morning, and it seems like she was a therapist. So she was one that kind of helped the kids through their trauma yeah. of losing yeah. their mother. So what better person? I mean, mm-hmm. the kids. All the stars align. Exactly. You know? Yeah. But what a scary ordeal having somebody, just a random person. Well, yeah, that rarely happens. You rarely. Know? Like you, the boogeyman, beware the boogeyman. But as adults, we're like, yeah, lock the door. We're telling you that so you go to sleep. And poor Danny. Could you imagine being that far away from your family and hearing it all go down and just. Oh. Well, and the poor kids. Uh, you know. Whew. That's a tough one. Knowing that they're. Oh, yeah. I mean, being led out past their mother's bleeding. All body, of that. It's just to, horrible. Yeah. Stay in their mind forever. Forever. I mean, six and three. No. They're young enough to maybe hopefully overcome, but they're old enough to never forget that. Exactly. But our heart goes out to the Cross family and all of Nikki's friends. What a horrible, devastating. No one should ever have to go through that. Mental illness, too, I think. And we've talked about this, like how it is. It's so shamed and people, it's a stigma and it shouldn't be. Like how we we still have not figured out how the brain works in mm-hmm. that sense. No. And this man had no clue that he was schizophrenic. I mean, he yeah. was just going into this darkness. Not that this makes it okay, but he's in a mental institution where he mm-hmm. needs to be to get help. But it's sad all around. I'm just going to say that. Horrible. 
Horrible. Fern did a great job. She's amazing. As woman. always. Duh. I as love always. that Fern. I love that Fern. Seriously, I do. I love her. I think she's absolutely adorable. She's funny. She's sweet. She's just... And she's a good person. She's our kind of person. I really like her a she lot. Is. She's one of my favorites. I think, too, with like this sort of case, this probably happens more than we know or like like to know with the mentally ill doing committing crimes, even if it's not murder, just things that they don't even know what's they they're not responsible he, for themselves. He thought he was saving the kids. He thought mm-hmm. that they were being starved. And if he didn't help them, something was going to happen to his family. I mean, he was not in a very good place. Yeah. Horrible. Just a travesty. But thank you, Fern. Thank you a lot. Have you, uh, going from one horrible thing to something light is always hard to do. But have you been watching anything on the TV? Have I been watching anything? The You're big so TV cute. show? Let me name it all out. Okay, so Dexter, you know I'm totally in. Haven't Gang watched Busters. the newest episode <gasps> yet? Nope. It's- it's not as good. It's not as good as the first one, but we're building. It's building mm-hmm. blocks. Okay. I loved Made. Did you watch that? Did we I have talk not about seen that? May. Made on Netflix. It just made my heart happy. Shameless. I cried Friday night. I cried. I was just crying. I was a ball of tears because you know what? Those characters, characters are written in television or movies and they just, Dexter was the same. Like you get attached to them. Shameless. Well, Shameless has been on for 10 years. So 11. You, this was the 11. 11th season. Well, there you but go. it's done now. I mean, it's done. And it, that's why it was like, oh my God, my heart broke. I was like, oh my God. Oh, and then also, let me tell you this. This is brand new for listeners. There is a movie on Netflix, and I think it's based on a book. The whole thing is called Passing, but mm-hmm. I love the way it was shot. So it is about two females in the 1920s. Harlem, Mm -hmm. and they're both black Americans, but one started passing as a white and they stumble. Oh, I read about this. (gasps) I wanted to see it. I loved it. I loved the way it was shot. It was shot all in black and white. Yes. So, and what's it called again? I cut you off. Passing. The passing. Just called passing. Yep. Okay. So it was good. I think it's based on a book. I just, I liked the actors. I liked, I don't know. And it like brought up all kinds of stuff. So my daughter and I were talking about that. And all the ramifications, I guess, if you will, of... Is it racism that it spoke of? Well, or? they're both black females. Right, but right? one passes the, as white. And there's as like they, a whole... they separate because they, yeah. they haven't... They were like uh, grade school friends. Mm-hmm. And then they run into each other later and she's got, you know, bleached blonde hair and she is passing. I don't mm-hmm. want to give it all away. Have you seen the movie The Lodge? Of course I did. Right when it came out. Yes, mm-hmm. I did. And you know I who Riley really, Keough is, right? I didn't. That's Elvis Presley's granddaughter. Oh, is that? She does. I just looked her up. She does look like yep, a little bit that, like Lisa yep, Marie. Lisa Marie's kid. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I watched that. Yeah, it was good. During Halloween, as you know, I don't want to take up all your time here, but what I do is watch all these scary movies. And um, I've seen about everything out there. I cannot even tell you. And yeah. um, I sent that to some people to watch because yeah no we it, were yeah. within my family with my 13 year old we were just discussed the Jaden martell or however his pronounce his last name he's the blonde kid with the stutter from it he was also oh, yeah. in um knives out <gasps> yep which is a great movie i love knives yes. out but my daughter loves anything to do with it mostly <laughs> the little dark-headed curly-head boys <laughs> It's her favorite. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. My oldest daughter also likes the dating show. The mask thing with the the mask where they, where the contestants are put in special effects makeup. And so there could be a dolphin or a beetle or whatever. And you have absolutely no clue what they look like. So you are basically. Horrible, horrible idea for a show yet. It is the biggest train wreck, but you can't I watched help. it. <laughs> I know. So do we. I mean, we're like, okay. We're, she's like, you've got to watch it, Mom. So I'm like, okay. Just going to like humor her. I ended up watching like the full season because yeah, it's because you have wreck. to. Because yeah. you're like, who came up with this? And oh, yet it's yeah. a punch in the face, but also a high five. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think can't. that's all I got. Do you have anything else? I got nothing, Jin Jin. Uh, I got nothing. So that was a good one. Thank you, Fern, so much. Thanks, Fern. Thank you for just loving us enough to, you know, help us out a little bit. And yeah. 
I was going to say something about it's almost Thanksgiving. Next week's going to be Thanksgiving already. And then we've got we've got three more episodes before our Nightmares Before Christmas starts. Can you believe I it? Can, I think I there's can, six <laughs> weekends before Christmas. It's been Christmas. a long six months. <laughs> so, yes, I can believe it. When but. your life totally changes. Yes, it's been a life. It's been a long six months, but it's it all changing yeah. for the better. So it's all good. I hope so. Right. We'll see. We'll Bigger see. and better. We'll Bigger and better. Onward and upward. That's what I just keep saying. I'm not even sure what the heck that means, but I, I like it. It's my motto. So, yeah. So anyway, Fern, thank you so much. And Jen, I guess we're about to sign off, are we not? I think so. Okay. And so until next time, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. Later, Gator. She and Danny traveled to Mayaca. Mayaca. It's like Majorca. It's Spanish. It's from in Spain and well, it's a very hot destination spot and I can never pronounce it. I think you did um, great. Cuz I'm not sure. It's an island in Spain and it looks absolutely beautiful and um and we need to go. I would love to go there but it's just a dream. Hold on. <laughs> I have it written out here. Phonetically? Uh, yes, I always have it. But Mallorca. 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 There you go. Because there is currently a serious risk that you would commit further offenses if set at large. They always talk long big, with a lot of words. Big words. Mm-hmm. It's hard, Jen, I know. It's hard to be me sometimes. <laughs> I'm Put that at the end, Nico. Yeah. It's estimated that at any given time, there are up to 90,000 missing persons, and that's just in the United States. Imagine if your loved one went missing. Is there anything that you wouldn't do to try and find them? This is Missing Persons, and I'm your co-host, Mike Morford. In every episode of Missing Persons, you'll hear about a person who disappeared and currently remains missing, as well as the efforts to find them. In some cases, there are clues to follow and leads to check on. In other cases, it's as if the person just vanished off the face of the earth. In each episode, you'll hear from someone that's desperately searching for that missing person. And whether they've been looking for 30 days or 30 years, the struggle to find answers is real. Will you join us and become part of the search for answers in these cases? If so, search for and subscribe to Missing Persons wherever you listen to podcasts. There are dozens of episodes available to binge on right now. And new episodes come out every other Saturday.